first poem that I want to share with you is a poem that I wrote um, after reading a book called Big World, Small Planet by Johan Rockström and with some photography by an amazing photographer called Matthias Klum. Uh, but it's about planetary boundaries theory, which some of you, I suspect, will be familiar with um, the idea of the, the Earth's different biological tipping points and that we should stay within them. Um, but essentially, this is a, a history of humanity in four minutes. So this is Big World, Small Planet, the remix. 75,000 years ago, on a high plateau in what will one day become Ethiopia, a woman scans the barren ground for seeds and berries, tightens the first bending baby to her breast, oblivious that she holds in her hands the future of the human race. On the brink of extinction, Humanity's population has dwindled to a mere handful. Perhaps just a few thousand of us remain on the face of the earth. Just a blip in human history, merely a moment in time. It is the story we never hear about how we almost disappeared. Some 10,000 years ago, upon the alluvial plains of Mesopotamia, an aging farmer gazes out across a golden field of barley. The ancient ones speak of a time when food was foraged from the wild, but he has planted with intent. Master of his own destiny, he is blissfully unaware that this very moment in time marks the inception of humanity's ascent. The following millennia will see us at our best and worst, from conquests and crusades, witch trials and slaves, to Renaissance art, medicine, mathematics, and the discoveries of space. In 1804, on a filthy wooden floor of a London slum, a young mother unwittingly gives birth to the billionth living member of the human race. Forty years later, her son mops his sodden brow, shoveling coal in the insatiable, fiery mouth of a shining new steam engine. Soot black eyed and bone broke, wary, he is building the future of industry. He is progressing the human race. 1950s housewife rides shotgun in a 57 Chevrolet Bel Air. Sits proudly beside her husband who represents the one-sixth of American working age adults to be employed by the automobile industry at the time. Oblivious to unintended consequences, they are paving freeways across the future. In 2008, from the elevated porch of a longhouse in Borneo, an elder surveys the thick, dark smoke, blanketing a land where forest fires are foreign. The rainforest slash and burn makes way for monocultural palm oil. The fires burn so vast that the collective smoke would account for 30% of global greenhouse gas emissions that year. It is 2020, and we are no longer unaware. No longer averting our eyes from that caged canary that has been lying unmoving for quite some time now. It is 2020 and the earth is submitting her invoices for the streets we have paved with gold. And payment needs to be underwritten by a monumental mind shift. It is time for us to step up and respect the boundaries of just how far we can push this planet. Become stewards of our collective futures and realize just how much our destiny depends on it. We live in a globalized community, a big world on a small planet, where our every flutter of a butterfly wing can either serve to strengthen the hurricane or fuel the winds of change. And like it or not, these days we make our homes in each other's backyards. A Nigerian farmer whose dreams wash away with the soils after every season's floods, the rain no longer soaking the earth. That man is your neighbor. The machete wielding clear cutter lives in the Amazon basin next door. Look into the eyes of the Congolese youth, risking life and limb and civil conflict to mine minerals for our mobile phones, and you will find a brother. This is not about sacrifice, but about embracing our full potential. It's not about saying no, but about embracing a resounding yes. This is about building the house of humanity with hard hats and steel-toed boots, traveling the mountain roads of our destiny with guardrails to mark out the cliffs. This is about humanity growing up, moving out of mum's home, learning how to do our own laundry. 
100 billion blips in human history have brought us to this point. 100 billion moments. In late 2017, in Wellington, New Zealand, a woman enters a fertility clinic with bated breath. <coughs> Sorry, team. <coughs> Just one moment, please. <coughs> I've pretty much completely lost my voice. <laughs> That's really it's really strange and awkward. <clears throat> Hang on a minute. <clears throat> okay, I'll see if I can finish off here. And then I'm going to hand on to Daisy. So in 2017, late 2017, a woman enters a fertility clinic in Wellington with battered breath. Nine months later, scanning the horizon for some seeds of change and some berries of hope. Tightening the sling binding baby to my breast, I hold one tiny contribution to the future of the human race. With every blink in my daughter's eyes, a blip in history. With every blip, a reminder of a global citizen in the making, already taking notes. Kia ora. Thank you for bearing with me. Great, it's 10 past three, so I'm gonna hand over to Daisy um, and I'll, I'll join you towards sort of about, you know, four minutes before the end of the Q&A and I'll see if I can get it together to do another poem then. Thanks so much, Alina, that was beautiful. And I, I didn't say before, but Alina is an impact storyteller, a narrative strategist and a spoken word artist under the name Ali Jacks, who works at the intersection of art, business and systems change. And we'll pop some links to where you can get more information um, in the Google Doc associated with this room. Next up, we have Daisy, a mother, cultural ambassador, community connector, and proud Samoan orator. She's currently working on her first poetry book, and you can follow her work on Daisy Speaks Facebook page. And we'll link that again in the collaboration doc. Over to you, Daisy. Well, thank you, Kit, and thank you, Alina, for that awesome piece. Uh, looking forward to hearing your second piece as well. Um, maybe when Alina performs at the end, if everyone can put your hands like so. Um, so in spoken word, you'll hear the poet kind of, um, we don't just write for the page, we add to it this element of performance, but it's an interactive um, invitation as well. So um, feel free to, when Alina speaks at the end, you can snap, even though you might be on mute, but it just kind of lets the poet know um, that the, we see you, we hear you, and thank you for being so brave that res really resonates for me. Thank you for the opportunity. I'm just going to share three short pieces. Uh, and this first piece was, um, I was blessed to attend uh, Singularity University one year. And then at the end of last year, there was a um, Pacific uh, event around how do we preserve our languages and also what is exponential technology kind of, what impact does that have for us in that digital divide space? And we had one keynote who uh, was from the tech industry and he was saying there were only 2% of Pacific people in that industry. So that was kind of a bit of an eye opener for me and I wrote this piece called Staying Woke. Staying Woke. I've been caught sleeping, unprepared for this rapidly changing world. My seven-year-old daughter still grips a 2B pencil and is told to write her ABCs on the dotted line. And I am concerned that the oneness of the world her 2B pencil will poetically bring about was disrupted years ago. Maybe we just didn't want to see it. Now we just cannot ignore it. And as I listen to exponential speak, ears teetering on the border of quantum computing, contorting attention indefinitely kept by algorithms designed to monetize my time by architects of the digital industry, I wonder, 
What does leadership look like in a world where innovation supercharges Moore's law? iRobot is no longer folklore, and Will Smith in his vintage leather chucks is screaming, those super intelligent machines could run away like the mad sorcerer's apprentice, but sorry, I diverge, when I should be converging. Intention, awareness, faith, appreciation, and the connectedness of everything and everyone. I can only pen a poem of the kind of leader I want to be, aware of the risks but drop the mic with value propositions and opportunity, staying woke that my daughter is the roof and I need to raise her, staying woke to the increasing importance of data, staying woke to innovation so exponential that human evolution and policy is always playing catch up. But we, we can be the bridges between the worlds asking the questions that need to be asked so that no one gets left behind, so that innovation gives back time to humanity and helps us become the best versions of ourself. To dare greatly and to code our Pacific languages with our 2B pencils in all worlds virtual, to walk with enlightenment and energy into a future where the future of work looks very different. To define impact as not just making a million dollars, but maybe it's about impacting a million lives. But the boss says, chicken, you can take the millions as you unify every strength and latent superpower to speak, to see, to think, to listen, to give, and to live abundantly. That's the kind of leader I want to be. Kia ora. Uh, the second piece, um, thank you everyone. Uh, the second piece, um, just following on with that whakaro around equity. Um, currently I'm doing some mahi uh, in, um, we had to take some help to a family that had like eight children and one device um, that they were taking and three of them were in NCA uh, scene level one, two and three. And so that kind of took me back and this piece is called Tupperware and it's a poem about me growing up in South Auckland. Tupperware. The 10 kg margarine tub from Pack and Save stretches on for miles out here, irrigated with tears, fears, blood and sweat. I never knew what real butter tasted like. The 1 kg margarine tub from Pack and Save is our smaller size Tupperware. I never knew why my dad used to only wait till we finished eating, or why he'd only pour my glass of milk only half full, or why my high school friends, man, they didn't even know what a white bread and a tomato sauce sandwich was. I'd never tell them that I knew the ratio of boiling water to tap water needed to fill the 10 kg margarine tub from Pack and Save so that I could shower. Or that my siblings and I, we used to cut up the bread crusts and serve it on the local paper and imagine it was a dollar half scoop from Wickman Way. Yep, mean as. I remember my high school friend on the bus with her Nike bandana, her Ray-Ban sunglasses and her free striped Adidas's. Yep, she was a mean as label basher, eh? She was flashing, flashing the butter chicken that her mum made from scratch. She was licking, licking the white coconut cream center. She went to throw away the brown biscuits of her cameo creams me and my mate, we jumped up and we grabbed them because we couldn't bear to see food wasted. And when I jumped off my bus in Mangere, South Auckland, I seen all my intermediate schoolmates. Chee-hoo! What's up, Wolves? Up to. All the girls were pregnant. All the drugs were hard. All their partners filled the prison cells. Their eyes empty speckled like freckles in the Moana drowning, like the Tupperware in our cupboards. Kia ora. Thank you, everyone. And my final piece uh, is a piece called Unafraid, and then I will hand it over for our Q&A, and um, Ali's gonna share one more piece at the end of that. So this title is Unafraid. I'm afraid of a lot of things. Like when you meet people to kiss or not to kiss, that is the question. I mean, I got a fist pump, they got a handshake, I'm like, not too soft, I got to shake strong, but not too strong because I'm a lady. I'm afraid of looking dumb. There's so much to overcome. 
I'm really afraid of small talk. I'm too busy calculating how much precious energy is wasted talking about the weather and wonders whether those words could shape shift into you becoming the change that you want to see in the world. Awkward if I've only just met you, right? And when they ask, how do you know the host? I get distracted thinking about the keys we hold in our hands and all the locked doors they could open, thinking about hineahuone formed from clay, the brushes of foreheads and noses, the hongi. From the last 2,000 years that has brought me here to this very moment, the tape rocks popping the soundtrack of my life, the Levites and gospel cousins who could sing. Ema tautia oele atua. Making me feel both the goosebumps on my arms and my sinful shoal on my shoulders. And how could I forget Papa's, Papa's uh, sermon on repeat? We used to fuss when the landlords dissed us. No heat, wonder why Christmas missed us. Birthdays was the worst days. Now we sip in champagne when we thirsty. This colonization of hip-hop spoke life to us misfits from the hood. I'm really afraid of seeming disrespectful because see my eyes blue, black, bottomless and opaque are the keyholes that you may pour in. We speak and our eyes they dance with this ambiguous intensity that's both invasive and vulnerable and my respect as you're looking at doors that are facing downwards or sideways or a blank screen on zoom just know miss that I'm filling vaults with your words. My greatest fear is that even with four university degrees, someone's going to find out I somehow snuck in through the back door of life's theatre, somehow ended up on stage, the fat lady's going to sing and call me out any second now, and painful perfectionism is this crappy best friend in my head who tells me I do not deserve to be here. And so when they ask, what do you do for a living? I tell them. I board my boat and cross over to the other side of fear preaching a gospel of purpose that we are more than what sits on the surface. I'm on team lit, rock and suits, carving my initials into the papyrus of your brain and scattering fragments of my body in every part of the world. What do I do for a living? I awaken sleeping giants and I run with them. Giants whose tipuna pulled back arrows on Hawaii and shot them across the Moana to set the world on fire, to set the world on fire, to set the world on fire. May the giants and us let the world know that we lived and we loved. May the giants in us let the world know that we came, we saw, we conquered. May the giants in us let the world know that we, that we were here and that we are unafraid. Thank you, everyone. Thanks so much, Daisy. Now we're going to open it up for some Q&A. So um, assuming that uh, Alina and Daisy, you're both comfortable with this, people can either raise their hands like this, they can raise their hands digitally, or they could put something in the chat box as well. Um, pretty easy with whatever, if you've got questions in the chat box or just raise your hand. Okay, so I'll let you call on people if, if they raise hands. Sure. Yeah, same here. Barry's got a question. Beautiful pieces, folks. Really enjoyed them. Um, for both of you, when you're writing, what comes first? Is it a lyric? Is it the rhythm? Is it an image? Um, does it differ from time to time? But yeah, curious to see what comes first, what spurs you to chase that or find that muse? Thanks, Barry, for the question. I think for me, it's different. Sometimes it might just be in response to a lyric or uh, an event that happens, or sometimes it just sits um, in for me and me, and I have to kind of wrestle with it. And then um, it's kind of like um, with like, is it Michelangelo that had the sculpture in that, that piece of stone? And I have to kind of, it's there, but um, when the time's right, I just have to chisel it out. So that's probably my creative process. How about you, Alina? Um, yeah, it's a good question. Um, I think for me, most of the time, it's a concept. If I've got an idea that I want, want to write a poem about. Um, <coughs> um, yeah, I'm still struggling with it all, sorry. 
Any other questions, folks? Or comments are also welcome. I had a question around <laughs> mem memorizing. <laughs> are there any, um, is that just practice, 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 or what's the, what's the key Pretty to committing much. it to memory, or is that not essential? <laughs> Sure. It's not essential um, if you want to if you want to get up and share your poetry. It's by no means essential. Um, I guess it depends on what what your goals are. Um, for me, I I love being able to connect with an audience and look them in the eyes and um, and have that connection. So that's much harder to do if you haven't haven't memorized something. Um, but the way I think about it is, you all know millions of lyrics of your favorite songs. You move them somewhere along the way. It's the same thing. It's just repetition for me. Totally, so so cool. I like that allusion to the lyrics that we um we know. I can still recite songs from like when I was a teenager. But I think too, one thing is that when we're writing, that can help us. It is the repetition. Thanks, David, for your question. But also um the um the manner in which we speak often, it's also knowing our why and our purpose for why we speak. And sometimes it, to help us with the memory, as well as the, um, the, the repetition and learning it, it's also how we write. So we might do intentional things like um, the metaphors that we write or the concrete things those nouns that you might picture in your mind. Um, so for me, it was, or the experience. So for me, thinking about church and how my cousins used to sing growing up or growing up and, and the hip hop music. So that, you know, those tangible little wee kind of signposts in your mind that kind of help you with the repetition as well, if that's helpful. Got a question from Sophia. Kia ora. Thank you so much for those amazing poems. Um, I'm interested to know what inspired you to start writing some poetry and performing. Uh, for me, for me? I've written poetry for. Oh, you go. You go, Desi. No, no, you go, Alina. You go. Okay. I'm going to go and get a glass of milk, actually, and see if that helps prepare me. So I'll, I'll come back in a moment. <laughs> but a honey helps as well, Alina. Honey in your warm water. Thank it's you. To <laughs> Um, I think writing, um, we, I used to, my parents used to make us, um, we do like reflections at the end, but he was, it was quite a spiritual household that I grew up in. So we had to like do spiritual stuff. But one of the things that I'm grateful for is that my dad used to make us recite Psalms, um, every night. <laughs> and, um, so once we started reciting them, then we had to like learn them. Um, and we were just fortunate that the church we grew up in had a lot of opportunities to perform. So that was probably a, um, before seeing what spoken word poetry is, I probably had that kind of, um, mastery as a kid, a real strict dad that made us recite. And he'd always like, he'd use his belt if I kind of forgot a line or something like that. So probably fear drove me to it, um, to be a perfectionist in speaking. But uh, my friend actually introduced me to um, poetry online when I was at Teachers College and showed me a video in the States. Um, and it's kind of blown up here in New Zealand. Uh, you've got um, many, I'm here in Christchurch, for anyone that's here in Christchurch, we've got a lot of youth um, or poetry groups that kind of allow spaces to write and come together and congregate and share. But we also have national movements as well. And um, so that introduction all the way back in Teachers College was how I came into it. And it's a lovely way anyone can do it. Um, often people think, oh, think back to their English class and, and Shakespeare and think, oh, no, I can't do it. But it's always about our truth, a story, some thoughts. And I've had people write poems in our workshops, anything from chocolate all the way to political ones about hands. So everything in between. Hope that helps, Sophia. Alina, do you want to add anything with um, what got you into writing? Um, I, I caught the end of your response, Daisy. It sounds remarkably similar to mine in that, like, I, I wasn't particularly into poetry in high school, and, I, um, <clears throat> and it wasn't until I decided, it, sort of discovered that it could be um, much more relevant to what I was interested in that it became accessible for me. So, yeah. um, we Sorry, Alina, like did you want to say more? Short on time, so I'll, maybe I'll try and crack into the poem. I'm not sure if we'll get through it, but we'll have a, we'll have a solid go. I'm going to pull a Nelson John. <laughs> so this is called The Hitchhiker. That's about stories. 
Um, and if this feels right for you, I invite you to close your eyes. This is really just a, a story about stories. And it's, um, yeah, if that feels right for you, then go ahead. There's platinum blonde hair, the beacon of light, amongst the tumultuous misty seas of lukewarm 7-Eleven coffee, wet tents and countless kilometres past. A patient valid to my reoccurring nightmare of skipping CDs and the banging hard house candy anthems I was into at the time. 400,000 clicks to her name in my 92 Ford Escort rolled slowly to a halt along that rocky anonymous stretch of Newfoundland Highway. And it struck me like a plague of locusts and I cracked windshield that this boy, he had stories to tell. The first of which was a painful display for all to see tattooed across his shins. Stories not of snakes curling out of skulls. No stories of half-naked maidens nor dragons he slew. Merely words etched neatly across the body's longest continuous tablet of bones and married with the softness of lily-white flesh that had seldom seen the light of day. And I don't recall what was written across this boy's legs, but a part of me wants to remember that it was something punk rock, something rebellious, something that did not conform the way that needles did not conform to bone. It could have been Latin or a passage from the Lord of the Rings, an inspirational quote from a favorite novel or a poem that resonates with that heavy breath before a first kiss. Maybe they were his dreams, <clears throat> scrawled across his bony hulks, just as they lay scribbled on the backs of traffic signs from St. John to Olympia, <clears throat> the time and date jotted beneath them so that one day his son or daughter would know what it felt like to be sitting beneath the blazing sun next to these lakes that people called ponds. For you see this boy, he knew this journey to be unique to both everyone and no one the same. He knew that we each learn the same lessons beneath the shade of a hundred thousand different trees that line these streets marked upon by a hundred thousand different feet. And we each dance to the same drum song of a hundred thousand different heartbeats. And still to each soul, the pilgrimage sacred, and the journey always <clears throat> incomplete. And long before I spied his skinny frame on the horizon, I heard him singing his stories to pass the traffic his lips and tongue working together to take him further than any tank of petrol, further than tires and axles may. When he lost his throat, his voice to one too many hitchhiker's hymns or a pack too many cigarettes, there was always railway boxcars, coast to coast amongst vagabond princes he rode. When he woke one night with fist in his gut and a knife to his throat, Moments later, watching his life's positions disappearing off into the night with the dimming of lights and the fading clamor of steel upon rail, when well, his path was paved by the air of jubilance and his unpunctured lungs caressing his intact trachea, and he told me that that was the happiest moment of his life. And in the day we passed together over land and sea, we traversed oceans of truth and we climbed mountains of tall tales, and we came to rest upon the coastal headlands with a firm grip of reality meets the twisting calloused hands of fine storytelling and exhausted we slept. And I dropped him off <clears throat> by the tracks just a few miles shy of Halifax. A smile etched on my mind, one story yet to be told, of a boy who wore his tails upon tablets of bone. Kia ora, thank you very much. Beautiful. Thanks, Alina. Thanks, Daisy. Enjoy your next sessions. Thanks for your energy and your your attendance. Kakita ano.